All right, uh, welcome. 25 minute timer. Gonna do that again. Here we go. Uh, by way of a midweek devotional, I invite you to grab your Bible and just spend about 25 minutes with me in study of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I have determined that uh, I can continue thinking about this chapter and, uh, and think more and more and more and more. It's time to just, you know what, hit a, hit a timer, hit a record button, and uh, do some study with you. And so uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I feel just this overwhelming need to, to read it again. And so let's read it, and then uh, we'll see where we go. And so read with me if you don't mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we were even found to be false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when he says all things are in subjection, it is evident that he is, expect, is accepted, I always say expected, is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. Glad that one's behind us in last week. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought, and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool! That which you sow does not come to life unless it, unless it dies, and that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body, just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. I love that. 
So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit the, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must first put on imperishable, and the mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That's what Paul wanted us to know here. Be steadfast, immovable, abounding, knowing that our labor is not in vain. And so, quick prayer, I'll, uh, I'll give you some thoughts and then... We'll move right along. Father God, I'm thankful for this reading. I'm thankful um, for even the portion uh, that we can understand. It is truly mysterious to consider heavenly bodies, um, especially as we are so uh, surrounded uh, by this fleshly existence, by our lusts and desires and this uh, seemingly, um, the seemingly idolatry, Father, that is to the things of this life. And I pray that we forsake that. I pray that we look to you. Uh, we long for the day when the perishable will put on the imperishable, even if we can't, even if I can't, Father, always fully understand it. So be with us as we study, as we think. I pray that this intrigues many of our number and that we are uh, made to, to desire uh, to more closely know your will and your way and to trust you, even in the things we can't always understand. Through Christ, I pray. Amen. So last week, very quickly, I had to kind of, uh, I, I wanted to rather wrap up uh, uh, the end of the study, um, trying, to, trying to give you lessons that aren't so long. I know it's a little difficult for many of us, myself included, to be watching these screens all the time. Not a big fan of these screens anyway sometimes, and so um, had, had much refer you study. Uh, the scripture and that and that we engage and talk over the phone or in meeting or in person in some way, but uh, so I had to talk very quickly about uh, a passage that uh, that just really uh, can can confuse or rather intrigue me. I, uh, I talked about the resurrection of the dead a little bit there, or resurrection by proxy. That's First Corinthians fifteen and verse twenty nine. Um, real quickly, just just by way of review. Um, I said last week, I don't think that that single verse authorizes baptism by proxy or baptism for the dead. The practice seems very odd to me um, and seems to really contradict numerous other places in Scripture that teach our personal allegiance to Jesus in this life is what determines our state of eternity. And so uh, just, just a good principle of biblical interpretation, not to take one verse and let that outdo or undo uh, all of the other areas, places in Scripture that, that, that teach something different. And so um, I think what Paul is trying to do there is, is making a point, um, making the point of their inconsistency. Why are you baptizing for the dead if there is no resurrection? Again, not giving it authority, uh, but just making a point of their inconsistency. I didn't mention this. This was on my thought later in the day. It's interesting that baptism was considered the need you know, the need for dead souls to have salvation. And I was thinking, would that not emphasize the high value that is to be placed on baptism? Again, so often what, what I feel like uh, separates, sadly separates me uh, from, from others in the world of Christianity is, is putting a, a high value on baptism as being necessary for our salvation. And so it was just interesting to me. Of all the things that they could have been doing um, to, 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 to give life, eternal life to the dead, they were baptizing. Again, emphasizing the importance of baptism, I think. Not heard a lot of people talk about that uh, or use, use that passage in that way, but uh, seemed to make a little bit of sense to me. 
And so upon further review, uh, very briefly went through verses 30 through 34 last week. Paul argues that if resurrection is not true, then why do Christians subject themselves in faith to death? So think about that with me. If, if resurrection is not true, then, then, then why do Christians faithfully subject themselves to martyrdom and torture and, and, and uh, uh, death? And so um, if, if Christ's followers only live for this body, then why the willingness to risk martyrdom? If resurrection is not sure, then shouldn't the actions of this life be whatever sustains health and wealth and achievement? I want us to very seriously consider that. Perhaps you're tired of hearing me talk about that, but that's so important for us to consider. If resurrection is not sure, um, then, then, then our actions should entirely be for what helps our body live longer, what helps our life to be more comfortable. And sadly, that sounds very familiar to me, um, sadly. I asked us to consider that closely back in verse 19, if you remember. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Again, if our life does not look stupid and pitiful to this godly world, then are we really following Jesus? Hmm. That's a tough one, but one that's important for us to consider. It's okay if our life looks stupid. It's okay if we stand up for things that, that this world thinks is ignorant, if even our own friends think are ignorant. Because we're not, we're not to live according to the standards of this godless world, to conformity, to, to comfortable living, uh, but to stand up for what is right according to the way of Jesus. I think Paul calls the Corinthians bluff in verses 33 and 34. Okay, this is really cool for me. You see, as we often do, it appears they may have been trying to manipulate the gospel so they could have a more comfortable and conformed life. Kind of like when we just focus on the things that we like or on the things that are easy. You know, it's pretty easy to show up at a building on Sunday and do things according to the way we think that we, they ought to be done and then really make that the basis of our theology and argue against other people. That becomes pretty easy. But living the Christ life day to day, you know, uh, uh, listening to uh, the words of Scripture that demand radical repentance and focus on um, the Great Commission, making disciples, that focus on radical unity, uh, getting along with one another, not just uh, just grouping up in little cliques and you know being negative toward others. You know that those are the things that Scripture talks about. How easy is it often for us to focus on the things that are easy? It seems to me that's what the Corinthians were doing. They were neglecting resurrection. That's a tough one, you know. And if we neglect resurrection, if we uh, reject rather resurrection, then we can make this life more about comfort, about us, about what we can achieve now. So I think Paul is calling their bluff. Notice how he does it. Do not be deceived. Bad company, you see, when you league with bad company, what does that do? It corrupts good morals. He says, become sober-minded as you ought. Stop sinning. Very plainly there. Stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. I'm thankful to God of recent. I've had this increased focus on this, just the continuous calls for repentance among God's people. If you've heard any of my preaching for the last few weeks, you've heard that, you know, I don't think it's very important that we try to figure out why things are happening. You know, why virus and why division and why this and why that? And again, they asked Jesus, why did the Tower of Siloam fall? Jesus' response was, lest you repent, you will all likewise perish. Again, I love, I, I appreciate rather how Paul just very plainly says, you know what, I'm calling you bluff here. Stop sinning. Stop, stop hanging out with, with, with groups that are godless, that are corrupting good morals. Be sober-minded as you ought. Some of the language there of the other translation is striking to me. Be sober-minded. Come to your senses. Wake from your drunken stupor, the ESV says of verse 34. You want to change your life? And I mean this. You want to change your life? Then you wage war against sin. Paul said, lay aside your old self that is corrupted in the lusts of deceit and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been which in the likeness of God, I love how he said that, which in the likeness of God, Ephesians 4, has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. Okay, change your life. Stop sinning. Stop, stop surrounding yourself with things that aren't good. Guard your heart, rather. And so this is the only way to experience the resurrected life, okay? And um, just, just really good here. Paul's getting real, you know, and I like to get real because Paul's getting real and Jesus got real before Paul. And so... Um, just, just a really good passage there. I think he's calling their bluff. And so let's, uh, let's move through uh, some of the text here kind of quickly. Uh, I think it kind of repeats itself for emphasis. Again, when we see repetition in Scripture, it's for emphasis. And so there's a lot of repeating going on here, a lot of ways my brain just... Phew, I found myself moments ago just staring out the window, lost in thought in regard to the resurrection and, 
and and our heavenly existence, a new heaven and new earth, and all of all of all of these all of these great thoughts. And I said, okay, it's time to hit record and start going, and just start talking with you. There will be a bodily resurrection. Okay, there will be a bodily resurrection. I believe that the Scripture teaches that. That is admittedly a biblical reality that I understand little about. I don't profess to have knowledge of any or all things. And 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 I, I admit that I know little about that, not because the Bible does not speak of it or because it's too mysterious. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. It is mysterious, but it's not too mysterious. But because my previous thinking has involved an eternal existence with God that is just, you know, I've understood as kind of floaty or even ghostly, I'm discovering that 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 such may not be the case. Okay, I'm I'm discovering that I have not given a lot of emphasis to this reality of bodily resurrection, and so bear with me. Some of these thoughts are new, but again, it's time to start talking. It's time to start a discussion. It's time to let Scripture be our guide and go figure. Just kind of listen and believe what it says. Okay, listen to what Paul writes. For instance, verse 35 will begin. Again, but someone will say, "How are the dead raised?" And again, I just that just so makes sense to me. Okay, again, because we're we're so focused on the physical, they've rejected resurrection, and so Paul's talking about it. And so, you know, somebody's going to ask the question, "Wait a minute, what? How are the dead raised? Uh, what kind of body do um, do do they come? Of what kind? Let me read that right. And with what kind of body do they come?" Paul's response is, you fool. Again, this idea of you're, you're not thinking right, okay? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. We know that, seed principle and so forth. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a, a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, another flesh of fish. There are also heavenly bodies. Look at this, heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one, the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for stars different from star in glory. It appears to me that Paul is appealing to common sense. You know what? While we may deny a bodily resurrection because it appears so foreign to us, because we've seen our loved ones die and stay dead, Consider how we also daily see life from death, okay? As in the vegetation, the vegetation that emerges right outside my window here, that emerges from, from seed, okay? From seeds that have died in the ground and have died. And how seed is not sown and then brought forth as seed. We know this, this is common sense, but becomes a plant or even a great and mighty tree just as God plans. And consider how we see all kinds of flesh. Uh, isn't it fair to say that there? Um, is earthly, uh, that, that is, I, I wrote here, isn't it fair to say that there is a earthly flesh and uh, if, I'm sorry, if there is an earthly flesh, I'll get it right here in a minute, isn't it fair to say that if we recognize different kinds of flesh, as Paul has said, then isn't it okay to consider that if there's earthly flesh, then there's also heavenly flesh? Consider the resurrected body of Jesus, for instance, and I, and I don't know how closely I've really considered his you know, the characteristics of his resurrected body, a body that resembled in some ways its pre-death form, right? They, they were able to see him and recognize him. It had the signs of crucifixion and that it had the scars of crucifixion. Uh, his body walked and ate with those who were yet to experience death, yet it was also uh, able to appear and disappear um, to to materialize within locked rooms. I, I recall, you know, how how his body showed up to to to, to those apostles and disciples who were in that locked room, and how uh, his his uh, his presence walked with those disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then suddenly disappeared. And so it was able to even ascend out of sight and into the heavens, prompting two men in white clothing to to say uh, to the glaring disciples, "You recall this in Acts." Chapter 1, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. And so in that need to think about, you know, the body of Jesus post-resurrection and perhaps our bodies, our heavenly bodies will be similar to that. And when he returns, okay, when he returns, uh, just for instance, quoting 1 Thessalonians 4.16, for the Lord himself will 
descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first, just as the text indicates there. These, these, these bodies will be resurrected. Again, I, I, I believe the spirit and the body will, will, will reunite, okay, um, from where it has been. We have some, some idea as to where the spirit will rest in this Hadean realm that we read of uh, when uh, Jesus talks about the rich man and Lazarus, you recall. And so back to 1 Thessalonians 4, then we who are alive and remain, okay, we who are not dead when he returns will be caught up with him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be always with the Lord. And so is this not what, what 1 Corinthians also indicates, chapter 15? I, I ask you to jump back to chapter 15 and verse 50. Okay, this is almost exactly what he says, just in a different way. Now, I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Okay, I, I, this, this, this body that you see that's growing older and getting gray and, you know, falling apart in various ways, it, 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 it can't live eternally with God. It must be transformed in some way. Paul writes, Behold, I tell you a mystery. You will not all sleep, but you will all be changed. Again, we won't all die, but we'll all be transformed in some way. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and when this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Again, that final enemy defeated. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Well, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The power of sin is the law can be a little bit confusing to me, but Romans made a lot of sense in that, in that we, we, we know of sin because of the law. and We could go back and review that at some point as well. But that last verse, don't you love that? Verse 57, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer right here. Again, there's a lot of things I don't know. There's things that I feel that I'm, that I'm gaining a, a better understanding of in regard to the resurrection of, of, of my heavenly body that will exist forever in relationship with God and before the King. But Jesus Christ makes all the difference. Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the answer for eternal life and relationship to the Father and Creator. And those who refuse Him will too experience resurrection according to the Scriptures, but it will be a resurrection to judgment. Their first bodily resurrection will, I mean, I'm sorry, their first body, okay, their first death, if you will, will not suffice what is demanded for rebellion against the God of love. Now think about that with me. The death of the unrighteous is a death that will not suffice for the wrath that is demanded for their rebellion against the God of love. But only the second death, the lake of fire, the furnace of fire, as Jesus calls it, the lake of fire, as we read about in Revelation verses 20. I encourage you to go there. My time's about to be up with you right now, but uh, make note of Revelation chapter 20 and see if verses 12 through 15 especially don't, again, give, give more light into what we're saying here today. So as I understand this sequence of events, and again, I, I, I willingly say there's more to be understood. You and I are waiting for Christ's return. And when he returns, the dead will rise and the saved will meet him in the air according to the scriptures. Yet the lost will suffer a damning judgment an eternal separation from God. The current elements will burn with intense heat, yet the saved will be judged according to the righteousness of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Praise God. Amen. And we will live forever in the presence of God in a new heavens, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, a holy city. What a day that will be. That's what I've currently come to understand I'm certainly open to further learning. I, uh, I pray that, that you have patience with me and that there's more time to learn, but I do long for the second coming of our King. But to quote Paul, I love how he says, again, back to 1 Corinthians 13, and I love to put all this together, one day we will know fully, just as we have been fully known. And such a belief helps my understanding of bodily resurrection as described in 1 Corinthians 15, when our spirit and heavenly body will be united to live forever with our Lord and King. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Uh, shoot me a text, pay me a visit, but mostly seek the way of God so that others may come to know the source of eternal life. Again, 
Seek the way of God so that we and others may come to know the source of eternal life. I love you. My clock says 25 minutes, and that goes off in five seconds. Hey, that's pretty good. I'll take it. See you next time. Have a great evening.